Well, this is Mike Lawson here. Uh, I'm honored to actually be a part of this celebration that Unpause having for their 50th year. It's amazing. It's been 50 years. Uh, we've had our business, Henry's Fork Anglers, for a little over 45 years. And, of course, I've seen a lot of changes at Unpause over the years. It's really grown. In the old days, uh, it was started by Dennis Black, and he used to come over by my house in a station wagon and open the back of the station wagon, and we'd sort through some flies that we'd use for our, we'd buy from him for the shop. And so that's kind of how we got started. Uh, I actually, li I've lived here on the Henry's Fork pretty much my whole life. Uh, I live in a little town called, well, just out of a little town called Parker, right on the banks of the lower Henry's Fork. And when I think back over my career in this fly fishing business, there, I've seen a lot of different things happen because uh, I've been in it really for 50 years. I started working as a guide part-time when I was teaching school, and then it went on for the, from there. Uh, my relationship with Umpqua, as I said, started with Dennis Black buying flies, but then we talked to Dennis about uh, trying to get Umpqua to tie some custom flies for us. And Dennis said, you know, he said, we're just starting a uh, series, not a, not really a series, but uh, a program where professional fly tires will give us their patterns that we can copy and duplicate, and then we can sell them to other shops. And he said it was going to be the contract fly tire program. And it was right at the start. I think there were two other contract fly tires at the time, uh, Dave Whitlock and Randall Kaufman. And at the time, I didn't really think that much of it. Either. I was mainly thinking about getting flies tied for our shop. But over the years, that's really grown into a, a great relationship I've had with Umpqua and, and I know that this fly tire, this signature fly tire program has has really grown. And so, it, because anymore, you know, back in the old days, you couldn't, you really couldn't get enough flies. It was, there just weren't enough domestic fly tires. Hackle was hard to come by. Uh, my wife and I tied flies for all the years when I was teaching school part time, and for ex and the materials thing, for example, one of my flies that Umpqua still does that they've done right out of the blocks is called the Hemingway Caddis, and that took three hackles to tie that fly with the stuff that we had to use, and today you could probably get two. Hemingway caddis out of one fly. Uh, because of the material was so hard to come by and so difficult for especially small flies like like we use on the Henry's Fork on the Harriman Park, we specialized in flies that were first originated by Doug Swisher and Carl Richards and described in their book, Selective Trout. And we worked pretty closely with Doug and he got us set up to tie flies for Cal Gates in Grayling, Michigan. Uh, I've, I've still never been to Grayling, Michigan, but Cal bought hundreds of dozens of flies that we tied for him until we opened our own shop. and. The, one of the advantages of the Swisher Richards patterns is they really work well, especially on slow moving 
water like Henry's Fork, but the cost of materials is really not as much and, and much easier to obtain because most of these flies didn't have any hackle. And so that was that was really appealing to me as a con, as a uh, professional fly tire. And as we got our business going, uh, we reached a point where we couldn't tie enough flies and that's where where Umpa came in. And so a good part of my flies are, they're not really flies that I dreamed up with out of the blue. They're variations of flies that someone else maybe came up with the original idea. Uh, one that particularly comes to mind is the no hackle fly, which we're going to look at in a minute. But uh, Doug Swisher and Carl Richards both described this pattern in their book. And then later it was described in Joe Brooks book called fly fishing and, or trout fishing, not fly fishing. And, but they, they didn't really have a very good handle on managing the duck quill. And they were the first to admit it. In fact, Carl used to buy no hackles from us at the store. And he used to have me custom tie some big giant ones that were bigger than normally we'd use. I think they were size tens to imitate the brown drake. Uh, but we tied a, the, the main reason that I really went with this particular fly in addition to selling them in our store is I love to fish. And I would go, I'll just tell you a quick story on the no hackle, and then we'll move into to look at tying it. I was really good friends with Renee Harrop. He had a great influence on me and my fly tying. And we fished together every chance we could back when I was teaching school. But in the summers, I started working for the Forest Service and I was living up in Island Park. Uh, in a trailer way in the backwoods. And I had a dirt bike and I used to ride it into uh, Wood Road 16 and fish when I got off work. There was an old car body in the river that was right in the edge of the river and just out, some of you may, old timers may remember that. And just out from that car body, there was a big trout that would be there pretty much every time I showed up and I could not get that fish to take anything. So one weekend when I was over at Renee's house, I told him about that fish. And he said, well, why don't you uh, take a couple of no hackles? And he, cause he was tying them at that time for Orvis. And so I took a couple of them and was really tempted to just tie one on and head straight for that fish. But I thought, well, let, I'm not going to be able to get any more of these for a while. So I hung on to them and I learned to tie them just trial and error up in our, when we were in our trailer. And when I finally got one that looked like it had halfway worked, then I went and took on that big trout and Amazingly, that fish took that fly without hesitation. He was a real big fish. He ran, he jumped a couple times, and he broke off. But I was so excited that, that I'd tied a no-hackle and that he'd eaten it. And so I kept perfecting him. And, and at the time, my wife, Shirley, and I were helping Renee and Bonnie tie flies for Orvis. They had some big contracts with Orvis and they were doing a lot of the Swisher Richards flies back in those days and Renee just had more than he could really do so he taught me and I'll never forget the first no hackles I tied commercially he asked me to tie 30 dozen uh, to imitate the Hendrickson's this is a big fairly good size no hackle size 14 and I'm sure those flies look terrible, but Renee took them and sent them to Orvis. And after I had tied 30 dozen, 
then I started figuring out how to how to tie them and I also fish with them a lot and so what the ideas that came up with me and my own philosophy with no hackles is that first off they don't have to look all that great because as soon as you start fishing them the wings split up anyway so it's not even if you aren't very happy with your results if you tried tying them you still need to fish them because because they'll work and secondly is the repetition of tying you know as a commercial fly tire i would prefer tying 50 dozen flies of the same size and pattern than i would maybe 10 dozen of a variety of different things and so when you when you start tying a lot like that that's when you get when you can really perfect your fly tying and you get to be a lot more consistent but uh that it's a great fly and i think i think we're going to start off with that we're going to look at a more modern video uh that i we shot this just a couple of years ago and I was looking at an old video that Jack Dennis took when we were traveling around together and I I didn't even have any gray hair. So that must have been 30 years ago at least and tied that fly. And it's it's been featured on several videos, but every time we do another instructional video, we learn another trick or two that we can share with uh, fly tires so they can figure it out. So I hope you, I know it's a hard fly to learn to tie, but I hope you don't give up on it because if you're fishing flat water, spring creeks, tail waters that have good hatches, it's really something you're gonna need to have to really be successful. So if we've got that uh, video ready, I'd like to get it on and let's watch it. We're going to tie the knuckle here today and uh, the hook we're going to use is a TMC 100 size 14. I'm going to use a 14 because it's a little easier to see but we really tie these on down to 20s, 22s. In fact I think they come into their own in the smaller sizes even though you can tie some of them. I've tied them as big as a size 10 and they work pretty good using goose quill for the wing. We're gonna use a six aught or eight aught thread uh, pre-wax. This one's gonna be a Danville's, doesn't matter what kind. And the color scheme we're gonna use for this one, we're gonna tie an olive body. And actually this one would represent a fly on our western waters here, called, we call a flab. Uh, it's a, uh, Drunella flavolina is actually the, the species of mayfly it is. So we're going to put a little bit of a base of thread on here. I, I don't like tying right onto the bear hook. I like to have thread to cover the base. We're going to use some uh, dubbing called super fine. And uh, it comes in a lot of good colors. We'll use one that's kind of a brownish olive here. And we'll start out with a little tiny ball of dubbing. We're going to use that to split the tails. So we'll just, don't put much, just a little bit. We're going to put that right up near the bend of the hook. And well, I caught the point of the hook there with that a little bit. So I'm going to come back and put that on there. Still kind of mess things up a little. It looks okay though. All right, and then for the tails, we'll use natural uh, hackle fibers. And this comes off from a, a saddle that's a whiting cotton de Leon. I really like this material because you can see it has a little bit of a fleck to it. It's 
it's really neat. I wish we'd have had this stuff back in my commercial fly time days. And we're going to tear off about six or eight fibers and measure the same length as the body, is how long the tail should be. And then we're going to tie them right in to the middle of the hook shank here. And then I, tying them in the middle enables me to, to look, pull back here and split these about, about evenly, as, as evenly as I can guess to make them. Trying to get about half on one side and half on the other of the, the little ball of fur to get a split there. And trying to shoot for about 90 degree uh, in there, roughly. So that's going to help balance the fly on the water. We're going to move up to the thorax position with the thread. That's going to be halfway between the end of the hook, the eye of the hook, and the point of the hook. That's, that's what I use for my uh, basis for all wings on dry flies. I think it, one of the things, if you ever get into tying commercially, you want to learn to be consistent. So you want to have all these different reference points, which makes that a little easier. And then we're going to take some duck quill. Might be hard to see that. We're going to take, take a section from the right and the left. And we're just going to cut a section out of there that's about half the length of the hook shank. So I'll go in here and just kind of in my mind, kind of measure that and make a little cut there. When you're learning to tie these, I would use less material. In the but you can see that it's about half. So that's the right wing, and then I'm just going to cut one off the other side for the other wing. And uh, we'll, we'll just use those. The other thing I like to do is, is lay them next to each other to see that they're about the same width. See, there's my right and left. That looks pretty close. The outside one looks like it might be just a little bit wider, but I'm not going to worry about that too much. So then the next thing we're going to do is measure for, for height. I like these to be the same height as the body is long to keep these all in proportion. So we're going to hold this up and then this is where it gets tough because you can't see, all you can see is my fingers. So if I lift this up, I'm going to kind of show you what is going to happen here. The first thing I'm going to do is lift the thread up in this position. So if I move the wings away, you can see, I want to show you where the thread is. It's right there. It's right in, uh, and it, notice it's above the hook shank. And what we're going to do then is we're going to come around this wing and around the far wing, go under the hook shank, and then we're going to end up right back at where we started. And then we're going to just apply just enough pressure to crimp the front of the wings down. A lot of times I think people really reef on the hook and it on the thread and that doesn't help the situation. You don't have to to do this put very much tension on there. So let's go ahead and do it now. You won't be able to see what's going on but maybe you can watch the wings and see the base how it, it just kind of crimps down a little bit and then when I come forward then notice my threads above the hook shank I'm going to do that once more. I'm going to go around and tighten back and up and then forward up and then I'll make a couple of reinforced turns around it and, and should be good to go. Now, the other wing was a little wide and you can see that a little piece of that caught the thread and that, that's that's probably good to show you that you 
you, you know, you don't, it doesn't always go just the way you hope. So then I'm, what I'm doing now is cutting this material out of the way and just clearing everything. But this little piece here could cause us some grief. So I'm gonna just pull it out and then just carefully clip everything out of there that we're not gonna use. So this, this little tiny piece is gonna leave. Now, this is a little bit of a tricky part here because what, I, what my objective is is to get the thread between the near wing closest to me and the hook shank. So I, a lot of times I'll just kind of pull it towards me just to kind of open those wings up a little and then take the thread under. And if you're not careful, you'll catch the far wing. So I'm gonna hold the far wing out of the way and just apply a little tension there. That's going to separate it. Now the other wing is harder because I'm pulling the opposite way. I'm trying to get it to go. So I'm going to go around between it and then just pull forward and just kind of pull it up. So there's my uh, wings are mounted properly now. And I'm going to do one more thing before I start uh, dubbing. I'm trying to get the thread now back behind these wings. So as I wind back through and end up right back near the ball of fur, I'm going to do one other thing. I'm going to take the and put a little drop of, of flexible cement. I use Dave's flex cement. And I'm going to put it right between those wings. And to see a little better, I, I tilt this. That's one reason I like these vices that rotate a little bit. I grew up on a Thompson Model A vise. So I never had this. And I, I still think it maybe was the best vise that's ever been made. But I di it didn't do this, didn't have this feature. So now we put just a little bit at the base of the wings there. We don't want to coat the wings. The wings actually are going to split up when we start fishing this. And that's good. That's why it doesn't matter if, if your first attempts at tying these wings aren't, aren't successful in your mind. Then we're going to put some thin dubbing, very thin for two reasons. Mayflies have thin bodies and also it makes it much easier to work this dubbing up between those wings. So we'll, we've, we've got a little bit there. If we need to put more, we will. And that also helps me a little bit sometimes if I tilt this vise a little bit closer towards me so I can see what I'm doing. I'm just carefully laying dubbing in there and then I'm working it forward up between these wings. And see that far wing, how it's catching that? Sometimes it doesn't hurt to just hold that out of the way. You don't want to have disaster right at the end. So we're just easing this dubbing up. You want to try to get it as far up in there between those wings as you can. Now that's about enough. So now we're going to finish it off. Just work the dubbing up ahead of the wings. And I generally don't use any head cement on these because I use cement on the wing and that does everything I need. Then I'll whip finish it. And We've got it. If I were to critique this one, the wings are a little bit too short and they're maybe a little bit back more than I like them. But uh, in general, that, that fly is going to fish 
really well. We'll turn, I'll turn it around here in the vise so you can see how the wings come out of the side. And then I'm going to put it in these hackle pliers. And I think I can also show you some different angles of it. As maybe you can see why, why it, it is a, a great fly. Let's look at it from, from the front here. And you can see the wings come right out of the side and then you look at the other view. And so what you have is when these fibers all split up, you end up with having a much better profile of the wings, the natural wing silhouette than the fly is now. And that's why I wouldn't get too hung up on it if the wings don't look just like you think they ought to look when you get it tied. It just takes a little bit of time and a little bit of practice, but it's worth some grief. It's a, it's a great fly. Boy, when, when I see that, it takes me back to all the hundreds of dozens of those we used to tie. And what I was thinking about while I was watching the video again is, is two really great innovations that we have now that we didn't have back in the old days. One of them was the synthetic dubbing material. We used to use natural fur and we had to dye it all these colors. We just get uh, bulk Australian possum and then get some rip dye and dye it various colors. And now we've got a whole assortment, all kinds of great synthetic dubbing. And then maybe more important than that is the hook. We used to use these old uh, mustad hooks and we would throw away, I'd, on a, a box of 100 hooks, you almost always had to throw at least 10 or 12 of those hooks away. You'd put them in your vise, and if you didn't put them just right, the, the tip would break off. They, some of them didn't have the right tempers. They weren't very sharp, and so... I don't know what year it was, but the first time I saw one of these laser sharpened, uh, really great steel in these new hooks from TMCO, I just couldn't believe how great it was because uh, they're really sharp. You can take the, the uh, point of the hook and rub it across one of your nails, your thumbnail, and you can make a little scratch right on your thumbnail. Now that That's pretty sharp to be able to do that. And the other thing I like about them, and this is not just the TMC 100, which as I use here, I use TMC hooks on all my flies and always have ever since uh, they first started coming onto the market. But the, another really important thing on them is how easy it is to crimp the barb down. With the old hooks, you had to be real careful. If you didn't do it just right, you broke the whole tip of the hook off. And when you were been working and, and uh, slaving away to get a no hackle tied, and it took you 15 minutes, and then you went to crimp the barb and the hook broke off, that was a time when you'd probably have about as many cuss words as we used to have when we were milking cows. So uh, we don't have to deal with that anymore. These hooks are just great right out of the box. You know, most of them have uh, a barbless hook that you can buy straight barbless. I generally stick with the ones with a barb, but I always pinch the barb down. So there's just kind of a little bump there. So that's two of the things that have really made a difference today. But then the old, 
the rest of it's just like it's always been. Good old mallard quill and rooster hackle feathers for the tails. And, you know, duck quill is, it's pretty precious material because it's really tough, but it's also uh, delicate and it's water repellent. And so it makes it a really great fly. So anyway, that one, uh, it's always fun for me to watch tying one of those flies because back in the old days when I was tying commercially, I could easily tie at least a dozen flies an hour. And now I'm about half of that. I can do about maybe six, but I still really enjoy tying them up in my fly tying room. So we're going to look at some other flies today. And I want to just move on to another great fly tire that I've known for many years. And that's uh, John Barr from Boulder, Colorado. John and I, I guess we got to know each other uh, when we were both uh, at the Denver sports show. Both of us would end up tying there and got to know John. He was a, became a very good friend, but he was one of the most innovative fly tires. And I think he was most famous fly was probably the Copper John. And I think every fly shop uh, still carries that fly. It's been around quite a while. It's still an outstanding nymph. But there's another little fly that John ties that I never had ever tried fishing with it. And uh, we got together, Jack Dennis and John and I, and, and did some some videos, uh, and I, I can't remember where we were fishing. It's probably on the video. We were up in the Box Canyon, and then we also fished the ranch. And John was hooked up all the time. I mean, he, was, he wasn't just a great fly tire. That guy could really rip lips. And so I had to, I wasn't doing that good. So I had to see what he was doing, and I walked down there to where he was fishing and talked to him and he gave me some about a half a dozen flies that were the bar emerger. He, at the time he called it a doctor bar emerger. He was, he was a dentist for a profession, but they were real sparse, neat little uh, emergers and, and at that time, he was fishing that fly as a dropper off of another fly, and we were using double nymphs uh, up in the Box Canyon. And then later, we went down and fished the ranch, and there was a particularly difficult fish, and John, uh, John uh, hooked that fish and on one of these little flies fishing it right in the surface film. So another time we were over fishing on the south fork of the snake and there were some pretty selected fish there. And by then I had all the confidence in the world in that fly. So I uh, put that on and commenced to catch and fish. So there, there are always some of those in my fly box. And nowadays I have some of them tied with a bead head to fish them deep and some of them uh, with uh, that I use uh, to fish right in the surface film. So if we can uh, move on, I think we've got a pretty good video of, of, of this Dr. Barr merger. You know, Jack, uh, if I only had two flies to fish the rest of my life for trout, uh, there's no hesitation on the decision. It would be the Betis Merger and the Copper Johns, but you have to give me a variety of sizes. 
and I really feel I can go just about anywhere and catch fish most of the time. Uh, that's how strong I feel about that pattern. Okay, John, uh, don't you put a flash in these emergers? You know, originally, for, for I can't keep the keep chronology of the whole thing because I started tied this first fly 30 years ago and it had mm -hmm. no they, no one put flash beads on flies then. Yeah. Uh, the flash, I, so I fished in plain probably for 20 years and I probably didn't add the flash till and bead till 10 years ago. When did beads come out? I don't know. 15, 18 years ago? But I, it's probably like 10 years ago. 10, 12 years. Yeah. I lose track. But, but you anyway, start adding a flash to it. But I added flash, I added bead, and it turns out my favorite sunken uh, uh, a merger. sunken bar merger is the flashback. And with this new Opal Mirage, it just makes the, it makes it a absolutely lethal weapon. This is a wee one. This I consider this large. This is about as big as I tie Jack. I know, I'm from Wyoming, and 18 is small. Now, this is an unusual hook. I actually have not seen this hook before, except for a few bar emergers I've purchased from Umqua. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a 2X short, 3 uh, extra wide, 2 extra strong hook. A lot of extras there. Because all I catch is big fish. Jack, all right, what's the number? Jack. It's a TMC, I know that. What's the number? <laughs> I mean, it's a test. 2488 heavy. 2488 heavy sounds like an airplane coming in. It's, it's a 747 heavy. Yeah, well, it's a it's a hook that I tr I pushed for for years because I wanted a ring eye hook because in the small hooks and these the, this style hook these little right. scud style style hooks I mean, you get down to 22 24 and you, you almost have no gap. Right, your eye fills the gap up. Right. So anyway, finally got the ring eye strong hook. And I love the hook. It's the same version of 9300 for our big uh, hair drives and stuff. We needed that 1X heavy hook, too, because okay. a, one, a 101 in New Zealand or 1-100 get straightened out with Just an 8-pound fish. Crushed. So 9300s came about. Okay. Okay, so now we're going to use some next, of this chocolate. This is a chocolate step. brown, a kind of a darker yeah, brown. You can it. use really a variety of different colors of browns. I use a lot of natural yeah. browns. I didn't realize this was dyed one. I think just I, just I a rooster feather, right? It's, it's, a, it's a nest. Let, uh, let nest me just cattle. take a look at this. Here, put that up there. And I think I probably have thrown more of these away because I didn't have a use for it. Oh, I know. This, th th you can't even find them in stores. No. Uh, it's bad. It's called bad hackle made good. I think, you know, it, it, the, yeah, I don't know where they come from because no. the, the, all the, everything's genetic hackle now and yeah. they have nothing but beautiful hackle. If it isn't perfect, they just burn it. And so there we get just a little bunch of fibers there that we're tying for a oh, tail. It's like about half a dozen fibers. Yeah. Depending, depending on the size of the fly, you mm -hmm. bigger you put, the fly is, the more you put in, the smaller it is, or fewer you put in, but fairly sparse. And you're just going to tie that baby in there, down around the shank, kind of make it look a little lively. And then we're just going to use that same dubbing that we used for the PMD emerger. Notice you went down the, down the bend just a little bit. Yeah, right. take, it, take it down the bend a little yeah, bit. A little, down the bend a little bit. That's sure, good. sure. Now we've got some of this. Uh, is same, this same old dubbing we use for the PMD emerger, right? Uh, and this gets darker when it gets wet. I kind of, kind of a straw color. You look for kind of a blend, or you can blend it yourself. Well, it getting, can be too bright, right? It's not meant to be bright. It's been a dull, dull yeah, color. Yeah, a dull color. More green, yeah, you know, just more greenish olive. Yeah. This looks kind of straw, but when it gets wet, it gets kind of greenish olive. Right. Uh, so then you get up there and it's really a simple fly. It's a very simple fly, yeah. And it's a good tough little fly too. Well, you know, as we talked about betas being everywhere, they come out in the spring and the fall and I mean at different elevations. Like right now it's uh late May. They're just starting in Yellowstone Park and they're done in a lot of places in, oh, yeah. in the United States. Oh well, our betas been going for a month and they'll, they'll, we could see betas every day oh, yeah. all year long. But the heavy mat hatches are spring and right. fall. And they probably see more betas than any other mayfly. Yeah. A lot of mayfly hatches are short, unpredictable, or sporadic. Betas are just bank to bank when the conditions are right, you know, cloudy days. And, 
Uh, but you can still get, get a nice beige hatch with Sunny and fish to see so damn, damn many of them, you know. Okay, now this is the flashback version of it. Now, okay, we're going to do the flashback version. And the flashback version just happens to probably be my favorite. My favorite Betas, version. Betas have a little flash to them, don't they? They they reflect light. Again, referring to Mike's book, you know, a lot of these insects have have a glow to them, uh, but it's just my confidence pattern. And then I know I fish with guides who swear by the bead, and then there are some places that I, I found a very very pressured fish, Jack. Mm -hmm. Where they won't take anything with beads or flash on it, then you got to go to the plane. You got to have everything. And those are, have the, those are ultra pounded right. fish. So I carry all three. Right. Okay, so we get our flash in there. So we're now we're going for the dun hackle. I mean, look at that reflection. Oh, I know. Head. It's it's just it's amazing, isn't it? Now we're going to put the wing case, the thorax, and the legs. Quote legs, actually little stubby wings. So we're tying a bunch of gray, just Chinese neck hackle, grayed feathers in. And you can use whatever you want. But oh, That's good. And now, now this is done gray. I mean, you could even use some saddles on this because... Yeah, I, I've used nets necks. You know, mess yeah. gray but you saddles. know, those, when you use a saddle patch, you get a little spade hackle left in there. Yeah. It perfect for that. Sure. Uh, again, some of the some of the uh, gray, super fine. Now, what I stop right there. I want to show people something. See how you put that on? Look at that. It's elongated fiber. Uh -huh. People don't realize that, that 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 you spread it out before you put it on. You don't put it on like traditional dubbing, and you can get the finest, thinnest bodies in the world. Oh yeah, I mean it's unbelievable how thin body you can put for that. Thin. I know. <laughs> so, don't, I can't even see that. Quit. Well, that's thin. Formatting me. That's thin, Jack. That's thin. We'll never be that thin again. Okay, look at that. And that's, you know, uh, a friend of mine at Guides in the Dejute said the biggest mistake people make when tying betas is they take them off the diet and make them too fat. Sparseness well, is really important, isn't it? And I. And you didn't like that. It was got, too thick, wasn't I it? I got to talk and it was too fat. Yeah. So? No, you got to see this. People, you can't be afraid. I don't care how much we've tied a pattern. Sometimes you just have to stop and do it over again, don't you, John? Yeah, absolutely you do. I mean, all of a sudden you get them and say, wait, wait, that's too fat. And like that's Jack says, slimness is, is, is very, very important. Especially on this beta. Especially it's on this slim, beta, you want slim, or a slim, inside. delicate little mayfly. But the interesting thing about this I'm fly... Like, as you're tying that and doing such a good job on it. And now we'll pull our hackle over. Go ahead, Jack. What I was going to say is that the difference between the betas and a midge is how they ride in the water. And when you get down to something this small, it's very subtle that it's tied right the way it rides. You agree? Yeah. All right. This is where that straight eye, or ring eye as you like to call it, Works so good because all the material is above the eye. Yeah, good point. In fact, some of the material is above the flashback. <laughs> yeah, not any longer. And I didn't even see that. See, that's your good eyes. No, not any longer. Okay, now we're going to snip the weather. And that's holograph. What? Now, give us that. It's Mirage. Opal colored mirage, hol not holographic. Oh, mirage. Look how they, that's a pretty neat little logo there. But this yeah. stuff is what, now this is a saltwater version, right? This is saltwater version, and, and it, the only color it comes in is this, which is opal. And this mirage, like, kind of picks up the color Ooh. around it. Right. I mean, it isn't just a single color, it's got a very sp special property, so it just picks up the colors around it. It is just the neatest damn. You know, Flash I use, I've ever seen. I use the accent mirage for uh, wing underwings for uh, fluttering caddis sure, and, and sure. stoneflies. Really good stuff. Sure. Okay, we're moving on. We are moving on. So we've got our flashback tied in. And if, if you want to use this on a smaller flight, you can kind of pull it and stretch a little bit. Right. 
or wing stubs back, whatever you want to call them. trim off the rest of the garage. I've got a few little extra pieces of mirage here. We wanna... Well, John, it helps to have a, a, a good uh, a pair of glasses when doing these small flies, right? It really does. And this isn't even a small one. I mean, this is an 18. This is a big fly. I do that. Doing a whip finish. I think this is kind of important what the next step is, John, is that uh, showing people how to trim it at the right proportions. And I know I'm going to ask you to hold it in the vise where our folks can see it. There you go. Perfect. Now, is that good? Yeah, that's good. Now, real carefully that trim those things. Show them their proportions right there. There you go. So, you know, just go a little bit past the one case. No. Trim those off. It doesn't, there's, again, you get some wiggle room there on length. A little short, a little long, that's okay. But that's about right. And we'll do the other so, you know? That's pretty good. Okay, real slow. Real so, slow. We got our, our flashback in there. Uh, we got our our legs slash wing pads in there. Uh, now, now all that's left is to trim the end, our tail, the end of our shock, and we'll just sip, sip that off about like that. Again, that can vary a bit. A little shorter, a little longer is okay. And that's basically fly right there. Now let let's take a look. The, the fly that I know, John, is the one that that you first showed me years ago without the flash of blue in it. And what does that look like? This. Oh, okay, that, that that's really the original. Good. Okay, put it in the vise where people can see the original. Again, without the flash of blue. And there'll be times you'll want to use this fly. I, I'll tell you where I think you, you'd want to use this uh, fly is on the pseudo. The pseudos are those real small where I think that almost takes away from the fly when you get down to 24s. And I use a lot. Oh, 24, 26 as you know. I, I use what's called a micro merger for those. Mm -hmm. No flash. No flash, yeah. It's, it's got a thread abdomen and then the front is just like right. this. Right. And we're looking at 24, 26, and even 28. 501. 20, 22, and 24, but it's uh, one extra short. I want to look at that again. And what we're talking about, real small fly. And for those out there that are that are real tailwater fishers, especially in that late fall. And they, uh, it seems like the later in the fall they get, the smaller they get. And, and, and you're absolutely right. You get your biggest ones in the spring, and as you get into fall, they get smaller and smaller and smaller. You better start carrying your 20s, 20s, especially your 22s and 24s. This is what we call instinct fishing. Yep. So mm -hmm. have a box of bait, it's 20s and smaller. Put the body on that one. That's oh. Beautiful taper. Is that what you want? That's what you're looking for? Yes, exquisite taper. Exquisite taper. It was uh, fun to watch that. You know, John tied that in a, in a betas pattern, but we also have a lot of success fishing them as pale morning guns. You know, here I like to fish the betas in the real small sizes as they talked about, 18s and 20s, and the PMDs a little bigger and it's a little lighter colored. 
One other thing as far as fishing them, it can be really tough to fish a little emerger right in the surface film uh, and know where your fly is, whether the fish eat your fly or anything. So I often will use a fly like that as just a dropper. I'll just tie a, a fly that, ha that I can see better, like maybe a, a parachute or something, and then I'll drop a, about eight or 10 inches off the bend of the hook and put that little emerger on there. Uh, one other thing with John too is he's got a great book. He has these, some videos, but sometimes a book, you can get some things out of it that you might not get from a video. And it's called uh, Tie and Fish, the Bar Emerger, the Copper John and other patterns. So anyway, I ought to give John a plug there because that's a great book. Uh, when I think of uh, innovative fly tires, though, the one that probably made the, as, as big a bang as anybody has was Gary LaFontaine, especially when he came out with his book, Caddiswise. And I don't know when it came out. It's, it's at least 30 years ago or a little more. It was closer to 40 years. And it's never been topped. It's still the standard in, uh, because most people didn't know much about caddis flies back in those days. And it's, they're, they're a little more difficult to deal with than, than our other aquatic insects. I first met Gary before I ever opened the shop. My brother and I went up to fish the Big Hole River up by Wise River. And Gary was working as a fishing guide for a guy named Phil Wright that had a lodge there called the Complete Fly Fisher. I was just impressed with how helpful Gary was and how friendly he was. And then a little later on, once I got into the Henry's Fork Anglers, then we started working with the Fenwick Fly Fishing Schools up near West Yellowstone, Montana. And Gary was one of the instructors. And we got to be pretty good friends back at that time. And then when he started working on his book, Caddis Flies, he used the back of our shop as a collection point because all these caddis would come off the Henry's Fork and they'd migrate over to the shady side of our shop. And he would stop by about once a week and collect caddis flies. A little later on, Jack Dennis approached me and, and said, because Jack and I had done a couple of duo things together at fly fishing clubs. Uh, actually, after that, I, I felt like I probably needed a psychiatrist anyway to survive that. And what do you know, Gary LaFontaine was that's pretty much what he did for a profession. He was a, a uh, he worked with the young people that were, that their fathers or mothers were tossed in the state penitentiary up in Deer Lodge, which is what, where Gary lived. But anyway, Jack approached Gary and I about doing in one of his videos tying and fishing caddis flies. So we went up on the Yellowstone River to film that. And it was pretty interesting because uh, a guy named Dan Abrams went to film it. And then uh, the three of us worked together on that video. And, and while we were there, there was a film crew from Los Angeles that were, they were doing a, a little piece on Yellowstone Park, I think their show was called Two on the Town. And so they saw what we were doing and they wanted to have some fly fishing in their, in their program. So they came over and kind of piggybacked on us. And they ended up winning an Emmy for that. It was really a lot of fun. We, we all learned a lot from each other. And, and then Jack is always thinking ahead 
he came up with this idea of the traveling fly fisherman. And he, he got Gary and I, and he'd book, book us to go pretty much every weekend all winter to some venue in one of the bigger cities. And we did these two day uh, seminars. They were a lot of fun for us. We'd kind of get worn out from all that traveling. Thankfully, traveling then was much easier than it is today. But we ended up probably going to every one of the metropolitan areas in the US. We did some of those in, uh, in Australia, three different places, and then and I'd seen Melbourne and, and uh, Sydney, and then we went to Tasmania, and then we went to New Zealand together. So that was, that was probably the highlight of the traveling fly fishermen working together. And it, we did sports shows as well. And we, we used to do the one in Denver all the time and, and a, a bunch of other ones. So we really got close. And Gary, one place I felt like I really wasn't pulling my share of the load is because Jack and Gary had written some great books. I think that first book of Jack Dennis has sold more than any other fly fishing book ever did. And, and Gary had these great books and I, I didn't have anything. I thought, well, I, I don't really belong in the same room with these guys, but they really accepted me. And I mostly focused my programs on spring creeks and tailwaters. And that, that's the kind of fishing that I love doing. And Gary, started talking to me about writing a book. And it really seemed like a good idea, but I didn't know where to start. I, I had written a few magazine articles, but that's a whole different deal than writing a book. And because I had all the, Gary listened to all these programs I did on Spring Creeks and he said, you know, you really should write a book. You, you need to, you owe it to the, fly fishing community. And so he got me all fired up on it. We were in Los Angeles, California. And we didn't go to sleep that night. We got to talking about this book. And then I said, why don't you hang on? Let's go uh, get something to record this on. So we went to Kmart or someplace that was open late, got this little transcriber to where we could uh, where I could record Gary and he'd ask me questions. And before we had it done, we had a great outline for a book. And so Gary took the outline and went home. And the next time we got together, which was about a week later, he just marked the whole thing up. It looked like some of my papers used to look when I'd hand them in at school. And uh, they were all carved up and, but he had all these different ideas. And so we edited that and it ended up about 30 pages. And the big problem I had is I couldn't get past the, the last chapter in the book because when you get into it, a, a book really is never finished. It's just finished for that time you wrote it. And I just couldn't, couldn't get past it. And Gary started really working on me. In the meantime, while I was working on that book, which I worked on it for probably off and on about 12 years, Gary got sick. He got a terrible disease called ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease. It's always fatal. And it's a very cruel way to go. And Gary fought it right to the end. Some of those last tri fly, uh, excuse me, traveling fly fisherman programs we did, uh, he was in his wheelchair. And it was really hard on Jack and I to see him go downhill. And meanwhile, I with the book, getting back to that book, I'd pretty much given up on it. Gary, I wasn't around Gary as much there the last few months 
and I had to go up, you know, he was in a place up in uh, Deer Lodge and then eventually they moved him up, I think it was to uh, Missoula. And, and anyway, uh, they called us, the facility that he was staying, and said, if you want to see Gary again, you better get up here because he only has a few days left. So we went up there and it was really tough on Jack and I, but Gary was, the, he was the tough one. And he looked at us and he says, don't start feeling bad for me. He said, I've lived more of a life than most people could live in 300 years. And that was true if you knew much about Gary. He really lived a full life. And instead of, uh, of us all feeling bad and feeling sad, we spent about three hours just talking about all our great memories together. And when it was time, the, the one thing I was worried about was I didn't want Gary to ask me about that book. And so we avoided it and, and uh, I had my hand on the doorknob just walking out of the room and Gary then said, how's the book coming? And I looked at him and I said, I'm not a writer. I, I said, you know, it's been a great learning experience for me. I've, I've done all this research. I read dozens of old books by the old authors, even back in England. And I said, it's just, it's just been a great thing for me. I worked with Professor George Edmonds in the University of Utah on aquatic insects. I, I was able to visit with George Harvey uh, on how to make slack leader casts and how to, how to taper leaders and just all kinds of stuff like that. So I felt like I'd really got everything out of it. And Gary just looked at me and he said, I want you to promise me that you're going to finish that book. So I promised him and about three days later, he was gone. So I came home and I just figured I've got to come up with a way to end this book. And I went through it and I was real happy with it. I, I had the outline of 30 pages and then I wrote a full chapter. I sent it to, uh, three different publishers in the fly fishing world, and they all wanted to get it. The best publisher I thought at the time, and still do really, was Stackpole. And they published it for me, and it's called Spring Creeks. So uh, Gary and I had done some other projects too. I don't have time to get into it all, but that's, uh, that's my Gary LaFontaine story. Now, I wanna talk just a minute about the most famous fly he ever created. And that was the LaFontaine sparkle pupa. And nobody could figure out caddis flies back in those days. And what Gary used to do was, was he'd put on some scuba tanks and he'd go sit on the bottom of the river under the water and watch caddis emerge. And it was pretty amazing all the things that he talked about. And, and that's how I came up with this Antron material because it's uh, got trilobal fibers. It's kind of triangular shaped fibers. So it reflects light from every direction. One little story quickly Gary said as he was up in kind of a deep uh, pool on the Big Hole, Big Hole River and, the, and when he went in the pool, nobody was around. And then he could see somebody was fishing the pool, looking up at the surface, see fly lines hitting the pool. So he surfaced right in front of those two guys. So you can imagine the shock they had. But Gary's a fun guy. He was always making us laugh. And I still can't hardly get enough of him. So uh, he's going to tie the emergent sparkle pupa here now. So let's go to that.
The deep sparkle pupa was designed to be fished early during the emergence, when those insects are first drifting near the bottom. But as the hatch gets going, as the insects start getting near the top and struggling to get through the surface film, you get a concentration of food and that's where the trout will move. And you can recognize the caddis hatch. You'll see the fish rolling, you'll see them breaking, you'll see them coming out of the water completely. The caddis emergence is on. And for that, you need a fly that is very, very near in the surface film. Actually, the emergent pupa is a dry fly. The wing sits up dry, you see it as a dry, you fish it dead drift just like you would a dry fly. The materials we use are basically the same ones that we use for the deep pupa pattern. We have the sparkle yarn, we have our underbody dubbing mix, we are going to add a deer hair wing to float it to look like the emergent wings of the pupa changing into the adult, and we have a little bit of fur for the head. Start off, take your ply of sparkle yarn, pull them apart. With your comb, comb out each ply. One thing, I'm not a very fast fly tire, but I did have to tie approximately 3,000 of these, and I used to do it each morning, so I did get fairly fast on this one pattern. And the same trick, tie it in at top, let your thread spin it right around to the bottom, and lash it in at the bottom. That's going to be your overbody. You let it stay there for the moment. Your tacky Oventon's Wonder Wax. Now, are there other types of wax? Of course there are. I like this, it's convenient. The Mixed Fur Blend. So important to get this dubbing technique. So important just to touch it. That will stay on the hook. As you wrap the thread, it binds it down. You don't need any more than that. If you ever look at the old English soft tackle patterns, they were very fussy about the type of silk they used. They had a number of colors for the personal silk, and they were very specific about the color they wanted. That's because the dubbing was so sparse that you could see the silk underneath the dubbing. They were not overdressed. And that's almost something you can apply to any nymph or wet fly. Generally, you do not want to overdress it. Finish wrapping your underbody. Comb out the rest of your overbody, the two plies that are hanging back. And pull the top ply over and tie it down. Couple of threads. Don't cut the stubs yet. Do the same thing with the underbody. Use the scissors point. Loosen it up. This adds a glistening, silvery effect when the fly is in the water. Now there are a few different steps, minor differences between the emergent and the deep pupa pattern. Take your scissors, snip off a few fibers on top. That back is going to be covered by deer hair anyway, so the fish wouldn't see any fibers that were on top. Let them dangle just a little bit off the rear of the hook. Now you can clip your stubs. Wrap down tight so you won't have any slippage. At this point again, throw in a couple of half hitches. Pick up a piece of deer hair. Snip off a sizable clump. This is gonna to have to float the fly. It's gonna to have to be fairly buoyant. 
I was at a show and I was tying and I was preparing the deer here for the clump to put on. And a man looking at me said, why don't you use a hair stacker? Why don't you put it into a hair stacker and straighten out those tips and get them nice and even? And I explained to him that I didn't use a hair stacker because it would make the tips nice and even. Look at the back wing of a cladis fly and that back wing is rough and ragged. Lay it back, a bit beyond the bend of the hook, tie it in. I like to tie my deer hair very strong. So after I have it bound, I'll take it and as I run forward, I'll go through the stubs at different spots, at different angles. It's probably the most delicate part of any hair fly would be the wing and you want to make sure you're not going to have it breaking off. You don't want it sliding or slipping around the hook. Snip those butts. Wrap your thread back. Now, you put on a fur head. Roll it so you get that opaque finish. And the emergent pattern is done. Now what about fishing this fly? Why does it work? How does it work? You know, we did the underwater studies and we watched the deep pattern underwater. Tremendous. When a fish moves, he sets up a feeding territory. He'll move a foot and a half to left to take the natural and a foot and a half to the right. The perfect imitation, he'll move a foot and a half to the left and a foot and a half to the right. But we started getting letters and comments about how great the emergent was. We had never done the underwater studies. There was no other emergent caddis pupa pattern around and we just didn't want to tie up a drab one just to do the comparison. So we were lazy and we just assumed it would be like the deep pupa, three times better than a drab imitation. But we kept getting these responses and we kept on getting these great catches ourselves. And so we finally decided to go back and to figure out if there was anything special about the emergent, why it was catching fish, sometimes in, in tremendous numbers. We looked at it underwater and what was happening is that fly, because of the antron, because those fibers didn't mat or felt together, that there were a lot of little air spaces and it would grab oxygen bubbles from the, from the meniscus, from the surface film. And it would be a cluster to natural air bubbles. And some would be hanging off that little tail to the back that drails behind. And they'd be kicking off. And we'd see fish. And you'd see a fish move a foot and a half to the left for the natural or a foot and a half to the right. All of a sudden, especially on flat, clear water where you could really see it, you would see the fish break off his feeding pattern, no matter what he happened to be working at, and come streaking across and nail the emergent pattern. That has nothing to do with imitation. That's not imitation at work. What you're working at there is a theory of attraction. Maybe the trout thinks it's a terrestrial. Maybe it sees an insect that's on the surface, kicking its legs, driving the air bubbles under. Maybe just curiosity, it comes over to investigate. But he comes and he hits it hard and there are times, especially on clear water, especially on still flat waters, when the emergent does seem to have a bit of magic to it. The emergent sparkle pupa. I carry a lot of flies. I like to carry a lot of flies. But if there's one that I would not want to be without, especially during a caddis fly hatch, it's the emergent sparkle pupa. I wouldn't want to be without it either. And not only that particular fly, but the influence that Gary had with that fly sprung all kinds of other 
caddis patterns and then the material antron he, uh, gary used to go out and buy it at the yarn shops but now every selection of fly tying material in any fly shop or mail order uh, is going to be loaded with different colors of antron it was it's an amazing fly i'm going to move on to another real important development in the fly time world and that was uh, a hopper uh, when i look back on my own fishing with hopper patterns i actually started when i was a kid uh, my my dad and my grandfather fished with fly rods but they didn't necessarily use flies sometimes they did sometimes they used little uh, flat fish worked on an old bamboo fly rod and and that's they just used whatever it took to catch fish my grandpa his favorite thing to use was a live grasshopper so he used to give me i think it was a nickel for every hopper i could catch and i used to go sneak out early in the morning before they got too active and catch them a bunch of hoppers and and he'd thread them on a hook and fish them that way. And I, I did that too. But later on, I started, when I was really getting into fly fishing more, I, dry fly fishing, I started trying the hoppers of the time. And there was uh, uh, Joe's hopper. I, I Honestly, I don't know for sure who Joe was, but not a good fly. Not a very good fly for, for least places where I was fishing hoppers, like in the in the Harriman Ranch, and most of the other hoppers didn't work in either. And uh, a guy named Dave Whitlock, who was he's a household word, I think, in the fly fishing and fly tying world. And I'm thankful that I got to know Dave. We were fortunate with our fly shop is most of the of the great fly fishing personalities usually spend some time in our shop uh, and I'm not going to list all of them but Dave was right up at the top with some of the great ones and he developed a huge number of patterns that were all really successful but the Dave's Hopper probably had about as much impact on the fly fishing world as any any fly at that time because it actually looked like a hopper it had the it had the profile and i think from that fly today uh, there are bins full of hoppers in the fly fishing shops but one reason is because when dave developed that fly we didn't have foam so we had to improvise and use natural materials. So now that fly has been tied in a lot of different ways. Hoppers have all using the philosophy of that Whitlock had when he developed the, the Dave's Hopper. And when I think about the history of flies like that, then I also kind of think about the how many flies and fly tires have stayed at the top and and been there for a long time and one of those is a guy that i have a tremendous respect for is charlie craven and and he he has all kinds of innovative patterns that is that are his own designs but he's uh consented to tie a couple of these flies that really weren't weren't his design but he's one of the greatest fly tires in the country he can tie anything so uh let's turn the next video over to charlie craven and tie a dave's hopper
Okay, the first thing to do before you sit down to tie a Dave's Hopper is to tie the legs. And what I've got in my vise here is a golden pheasant tail feather. Now you can use a turkey feather, uh, turkey tail feather, um, or regular ringneck pheasant uh, tail fibers, but uh, this is how you'll make the legs. Um, what I've got is the whole feather uh, clamped in my vise, and I'm going to pull off oh, five or six fibers off of one side, and I'm going to hold them out here, and I'm going to use a crochet hook. And I'm going to drop it over the top and twist the fibers around. I get that up there where you can see it. And then the trick here is to hook the tips in the hook as that latch closes, and then I'll pull that through, and that forms our overhand knot. So we've got one neatly knotted little leg there, and we can continue up, up the stem and tie several of those on both sides and kind of get our set done. So that's how you do the legs. Um, there is a step-by-step -step on my website that's got photographs of that uh, that go a little slower, but in the interest of saving a little bit of time, that's the, the quick version. So let's tie the Dave's Hopper. Um, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to take a 5262, and we'll tie a size 12. Get my vise up here where you can see it. And I'm going to start off, um, on, on these flies I've actually been using uh, uh, Superfly Nano Silk, so I'm going to use um, 30, 30 denier yellow nano silk, and I'm going to start this thread up fairly close to the hook eye, about a fourth, you know, maybe 20-25% of the way back from the hook eye, and I'm going to dress the hook shank back and forth with a couple layers of thread. And then for the tail, I'm going to use just a little pinch of uh, this is deer belly hair dyed red. Um, you could use red bucktail also. Um, you want to use the, the finer stuff if you can. Um, but I'm going to take a little clump of this red deer belly hair and I'm going to stack this up and this will be the tail on our fly. So I'll give that a few taps. It's pretty staticky so we might do that one more time. And uh, what we're looking for here it's just a short little red tail. Um, you know, Dave's hopper was the, the first hopper uh, back in the day that really looked like a hopper. Um, and they all got a little bit of red on them. Sometimes it's in the legs, um, you know, sometimes it's even on the body, but I think uh, Dave Whitlock's idea here was just to add a little bit of red. Uh, so that's what I just did there. So I tied that down at the bend, and you can see I laid that down as I was talking about other things. Um, and I'm going to bring that up close to the front of the hook and trim those butt ends off. And then I'll wrap back over all this to anchor it down. You can see I'm just kind of building the underbody with that. Um, one of the biggest things with this fly, and I used to tie tons of these before I came up with my Charlie Boy Hopper, um, but one of the biggest things with this fly is you want to sort of almost crowd the eye. Everybody is kind of gets hung up on trying to leave space for the head, um, and really the trick is you want to leave, a, a, leave less space up there for the, for the head end of the fly. Um, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a piece of, and this is not a whole strand on a size 12, but a piece of yellow poly yarn. And I'm going to tie this in up here where I ended those tailing fibers. I'm going to wrap back over it to the bend. And this body, um, you know, as long as we're talking about kind of heritage flies, uh, sort of came from the Joe's hopper. Um, what we're going to do is make a little extended body by making a loop there with that yarn, catching it with a few turns of thread, anchoring that down there. And then again, I'll bring my thread forward and tie that down again. Um, and you can see the idea of this is to sort of build the, the diameter of the underbody so that it stays level, uh, level and even. Now we're going to take a brown hackle feather, which is just over here, out of my reach. So I'll grab one of these. And the size of this feather really doesn't matter because we're going to trim it off. Um, so this is sort of a good opportunity to use... Uh, maybe some of your bigger feathers, or feathers that you don't normally use. And I've stripped the end of that feather. And I'm going to tie that in at the bend here, just by that bare stem, and let that hang for a second. And then I'm going to come in with another piece of that poly yarn, and this is maybe like a fourth or a fifth of a strand. It's a pretty, pretty thin strand of that yellow poly. I'll tie that in and wrap back over it. 
And what we've done there is built up a, a fairly large diameter body. Um, but instead of wrapping that big fat strand of poly, we're going to wrap this little bit flatter, more ribbony uh, piece of a strand to build the body. Now when I tie this off, I'm trying to keep a, a nice square shoulder here at the front end. And this will all make sense as we get a little further along in the fly. So I want to kind of leave that up on top. And then I'm going to start to plumber my hackle. And this is just evenly spaced turns. About like so. I'll tie that off. And trim that stem out. Get just a couple anchor wraps on there. And then I'm going to trim this hackle off. So I'm going to trim it down short. As short as I can, really, on the top. You want to be careful that you don't cut your little loop back here. And then I'll turn the hook and trim it off on the sides. You can see how I expertly move my thread out of the way so I don't cut it. And on the bottom, I'm going to leave that just a bit longer. So we've just trimmed that, trimmed that hackle down. Uh, so we've just got kind of a little bristly uh, little surface area that we've added there. So then for the wing case, I'm going to use... This is a turkey tail quill feather um, that I've coated with vinyl cement or flexible cement or even clear spray paint. Um, and the reason I do that is that'll keep this from splitting. So I'm going to separate out a, a section of this quill. It's a little wider than the gap of the hook. And I'm going to fold it. Got a couple little ragged edges here. I'm going to fold it in half, like so. And then I'm going to cut that into a curve so that I end up with a shape like that. And this is going to become our wing. So I'm going to take this and just extend this just past, you know, really just about to the end of the, the red tail there. And anchor that in place. And I kind of want to make a little band of thread there. And you can see how that's cupped over the top of the body. And I can lift those butt ends up. And you can see those won't fray because they're all, all been head cemented together. So now I'm going to take one of those legs that I made, and I'm going to put one on the far side, and I put the knee just about even with the bend of the hook. So I'm going to hold it against the far side of the hook and catch it with several turns of thread. That's one of the advantages of this 30 denier thread, um, is you can do, do a lot of thread work without, uh, without building up a lot of bulk. Um, one thing that I did to these legs in between is on that kicker portion, I've just put a drop of head cement, and I'll just smear that down the leg, and that keeps those those lower fibers all stuck together. So now I'll take the second leg, get the knee even with the first one, you can kind of tweak those, you want them kind of widespread like that, and then I'll trim those butt ends out. Now typically when I sit down to tie these, I'll do these up to this point uh, and whip finish right here. And then I'll do the heads all at once. Now, in this case, you're not gonna, I'm not going to do more of them. I'm just going to do this one. So uh, I'll put a little shot of head cement on there just to hold things in place in the meantime. And I'm going to make a thread base right up to the hook eye. And back again up onto that base. So now I'll take, clean up my work area here a little bit, a piece of uh, fine deer hair. And I want a pretty good size clump here. It's sort of surprisingly big for, for what's going to end up being a, a small fly, but a pretty good size chunk of fine tip deer hair. And you want something with, with good tips that uh, will make a nice collar on the finished fly. I want to clean that out. And I'll put that in my medium stacker. Stack him up a bit. Got a nice even bunch like so. And I'll take that out of my stacker. Now usually I want to reverse this. I'll usually trim the, the butt ends just a bit. Um, as they sit now they're fairly long and ragged so I'll ju I'm just going to trim them down so that they're square. Uh, it just makes this hair a little easier to work with. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to measure this hair about halfway up the body. I'm going to take my thread up and over the hair one turn, two turns, and then I'm going to hold it in place and I kind of push it down around the hook as I tighten that thread down. 
I'll follow that up with one more turn and pull down good and tight. That's one of the advantages of that uh, gel spun thread is it's very strong so we can really crank that hair down. So now I'm going to come in and I just move the thread forward in front of that bunch. So that's entirely tied in just with those three turns on top of the, uh, the front edge of the body. And that's going to let our collar sort of form or bleed right into the, into the body section without a big gap between the two. So now I'm going to take another clump of hair about the same size. And in this case, I'm going to trim the, trim the tips off. I'm going to sweep this bunch of hair back, and I'll lay this hair in, and I want it center, even with where my thread's hanging, which is right in front of that first bunch. And sort of same move, I'm going to just tighten a little bit on that first turn, just to crease the hair. And I'll put three turns through there. And I'm going to hold on to this. That kind of snuck a little early on me. And just let my thread work forward through those butt ends. And I'm going to push that hair back. Um, you could probably... I think this one's actually probably good with two. I had two pretty nice bunches on there. You might need to use a third bunch just to kind of pack that in. I'm going to whip finish my thread. So I spun that second bunch, but just flared the first bunch. Now one of the things I like to do on, on hair bugs of any kind, anything that's got a, a spun and trimmed deer hair head, um, is I like to, uh, to steam the hair a bit. Uh, so you can hear in the background there that, uh, that, that noise. And what that is is a, an electric teapot that I have up here on my desk that I'm going to steam this fly over. So you can see the shape of, of this hair right now. Um, what the steam is going to do is stand that hair up. As we pack the hair on the hook, uh, we flatten it out a bit. And uh, as we steam the hair, we're going to make that hair more round and, and uh, make it uh, puff up underneath the thread. So it's going to get even tighter. It's going to tighten those thread wraps down. Um, but it's going to make the hair a little bit stiffer so it stands up to the... Uh, to the razor blade that we're going to trim this fly with. So I'm going to take this out of the vise. I'm going to hold him over here over my tea kettle, which is not quite done yet, so I'll just wait for it to, to get a little more steam going and we'll talk about this fly. Um, you know, again, this is uh, you know, one of the, the oldest uh, hopper patterns out there. You know, save for a Joe's hopper, I think is older, but uh, uh, the Dave's hopper is still a fly that, that works these days. I mean, we sell, still sell tons of them here in the shop. Um, great little fly. Um, but a fairly complicated pattern, so um, you know I realize I'm rushing through this just because we don't have uh, hours and hours to go through it. But this is a fly that took me, you know, hundreds of flies to, to tie before I really got the fly down. So um, if it's not coming out on your first few tries, don't be surprised and don't be frustrated. This is uh, this is not an easy fly to tie. You know, so many of these flies these days, you know, you see a video and you can go home right right home and tie it. Um, this is a good test to see if you're the real deal or not. So um, I hear my water boiling. I'm going to take this and I just got it held in a pair of D-bar pliers. I'm just going to hold it over the steam and I'll bring it right back here for you. You can see it just takes about that long. So you can see that puff that hair all up. Um, it's standing up much more, kind of sticking out in front of the hook eye. Um, that's what we're shooting for there. Um, and you want to hold it in a tool for sure. You don't want to hold it in your fingers because it'll burn you. Um, now typically when I trim these, I, I do this um, in my fingers like this. I'll try to hold it up here by the vise where I can see it. It's going to make a mess, but um, what I've got is I've got the hook upside down. Try to give you an idea where we're at here. There's the hook eye. I've got the hook upside down, and I'm just going to trim flat across the bottom of the fly. And I apologize in advance if I blow any of that deer hair onto the camera, um, as well as I know you guys can't see everything I'm doing here, but what I've just done is trim the bottom of that pretty flat. Okay. Now I'm going to go just straight up from the hook eye and I'm going to trim the face square. Um, so just a double edge razor blade. I've broken it in half so I don't have to worry about cutting myself with the other edge. That's what I'm working with there. But So I've trimmed the face flat. And now I'm going to come in from the sides and I'm going to start to just really make a square is what I like to think of. So I'm going to cut the two sides off and in a minute here this will get a little bit more recognizable. There we go. Kind of get in the shape we're after. And then I'll come in across the top. Now I don't like to slant this. I want to try to keep this fairly square. You can see I cut the butt ends of the, of the collar off with that cut. And then from this point is the sort of age-old fly tying problem of uh, when you're trimming a bug, knowing when you're done. Um, you know, I can sit and trim all day long on these things. Get that in the vise. You can see that's pretty clean already. Um, you know, and re realistically, that's that's totally all you need. Um, I'll sit and trim on this thing for 
for another hour just trying to get every little hair cleaned up. Um, you can see my left-handed tying technique here. Puts my, my left hand on the vise. Any of these butt-ins that you've got left in here, you can trim out with your scissors. I'm going to say I'm pretty happy with that for like four swipes with the razor blade. Usually I'll, uh, and I undoubtedly still will, go in at this and, and really clean this up a bunch. But um, you can see that kind of square-shaped head that we're after. Square hopper-shaped head. And you can kind of see from the bottom there what the proportion of the head to the body is. Um, clean that up there. Um, if you leave any of those blunt ends sticking out of your hopper, that's um, pretty much guaranteed to not catch a fish. So I always try to trim those off. Trim off all any of these extra pieces um, and then the last thing I'll do is I'll trim the legs and so I'm just going to pinch them together and I'll trim them oh I'm going to say they're three quarters of a shank length long I don't like them too long um, and just kind of reposition sometimes that steam will will reposition those legs for you um, so you can see those widespread hopper legs from the bottom pretty hoppery silhouette on this fly and uh, um, you know other than the poly yarn body entirely natural materials which is pretty cool um, this fly does sit pretty low in the water like a real hopper um, you know, the liability of it is that deer hair head after a while will get soaked through and it's, it's hard to make it float. But, uh, um, you know, some uh, modern day floatants cure that problem pretty darn quick. But um, old fly uh, from one of the, the best fly tires in the, in the world, in the industry in the world. Uh, Dave Whitlock was just groundbreaking with, with so much of the stuff that he did um, and, uh, and still does these days. You know, you still see him at shows and he's still just as nice as can be. Uh, so I can't say enough about him. Um, you know, years ago I had asked him about tying this fly and um, I asked him if he trimmed the heads with the razor blade and he said, no, I don't, I don't trim them with razor blades anymore because I, I used a razor blade once in a demo and I cut myself and when you cut yourself in a demo, all you do is sit there and bleed. So he used scissors. Um, I got all the way through this one and I'm, I'm not bleeding. You know, my finger's still intact, so I'm going to count that one as a win. Um, really, the win is that I got that head pr trimmed fairly quickly for you. So uh, there's the Dave's Hopper. Um, thanks for watching. That was a fun one. Took more practice than uh, than I anticipated. I hadn't tied one of these in a long time, but I'm not I'm not unhappy with the way that came out. So thanks for watching. I'm Charlie Craven. Well, that wasn't bad for somebody that hasn't tied one for a long time. One thing I was thinking about, and I'm glad he mentioned Dave and the razor blade, because I, I was thinking, boy, guys my age, you don't want to be getting a razor blade in your hand. You'd be dangerous. So anyway, uh, Charlie's going to come back and, and do another fly here later. And I want to kind of tell you a little bit, not so much about the fly itself, but about the guy that designed it. Uh, I was frequently invited to be a fly tire at the Federation of Fly Fishermen's, or Fly Fishers, I should say, conclave in West Yellowstone when they used to have it. Well, they had it a lot of other places too, but this particular one was in West Yellowstone. And so they all have your little place set aside for you to tie and they've got uh, your name tag there and everything so i went in and sat down and the guy next to me i hadn't ever heard of him uh, it was theo bacalar i think is how you say his last name and he was from uh i don't remember the countries scandinavian one of the scandinavian countries though and so anyway, I got my stuff out and was getting started to tie. And then here he came. He came walking in. I turned around and looked at him. And he had a, it uh, was kind of like a metal bowl on top of his head. And then he painted not only the bowl, but the rest of his head gold. And I, I mean, that's gonna, that's definitely gonna get your attention. I looked at that guy. And uh, he introduced himself. He he was a pretty fun guy to be tying next to, and he was tying a whole variety of of nymphs, and all of them had a bead on the fly, bead head. And I had never seen a bead head fly mm -hmm. before, and he he was just raving about it, and he gave me a couple of them to 
try. I, I think he gave me a half a dozen or so, which I, I honestly was so skeptical. I didn't think that would ever catch a fish. But I took them, and I don't think I took one out and tried to fish with it for probably several weeks. Uh, and I had given a couple of them to one of our guides who was still with us, very well-known guide named Bob Lamb. I gave him a couple of those nymphs, and I said, what do you think of these? And he, he had the same reaction I did. He laughed and he said, what are they going to think of next? Well, he took them and I kind of forgot about the beadhead flies. And Bob came in one day and he said, you know what? He said, I tied one of those on with another nymph. I, I did a, a dropper and he said, didn't matter whether I put that fly as the top fly or the bottom one, the fish just ate the dropper. That's all they eat was the beadhead fly. And I said, you're kidding. Because I, I honestly couldn't believe that a fish would eat that. So I decided that I had a couple left, so I decided to try them. And sure enough, they caught fish. So that was, oh, that was at least, 30 years ago, I think, probably longer than that. My my uh, recollection of time isn't as good as it used to be because it goes by so fast. But when I think of uh, what's happened in fly tying over the last 50 years since I've been involved in, in fly tying, that might be the biggest deal that's ever hit fly tying. Because today, just look at what's happened with beadhead nymphs. And there's uh, every color of beads. Now there's tungsten beads. There's, there's, it's just hard to envision a nymph that you want to fish deep without a bead on it. And I, I, Gary and LaFontaine and I talked about that quite a bit as to why these beadheads work so good. Gary felt like there was three things that made them effective. One is they sink faster. Having that weight, rather than wrapping lead all the way up the, the hook shank that we used to do with nymphs, still do a little of that. But with the, all the weight concentrated up in the head, it made that nymph cut through the water better and it, it was would sink quicker. Then the the second thing was obvious, and that's the attraction of the bead. Fish definitely see that bead. And then the third thing is the way the fly drifts in the, in the current. Uh, you know, I think it, having that weight all up in the head, it kind of gives it more of a lifelike appearance. They, they don't always work. I've fished quite a bit in New Zealand. And those trout over there, they generally don't like a real bright bead. So when I tie flies when I've been in New Zealand, usually I use a black one. But that's just my own background with the bead head. I, I have started right, right out with uh, really laughing. I was really skeptical. But... Old Theo got the last laugh on us to see what's happened today. So Charlie is going to tie one of Theo's favorite patterns, and it's called a posse bugger. I'm not sure why the name posse, but maybe Charlie might share that with you. But anyway, if anybody can tie it, Charlie can. So let's turn it over to him. All right, now we're going to tie Theo's the Posse Bugger. This is one of the first beadhead flies that ever came out. Um, and uh, uh, still a fly that works pretty well today. Uh, my 
friend uh, Blake Clark up in Wyoming still fishes this fly. Um, and he always makes me laugh because uh, I always say, does anybody still fish that fly? And he says, yeah, I do. And then reaches into his box and he pulls some out. But uh, um, this fly is really, uh, you know, essentially by today's standards, what you would uh, uh, call something very similar to a, a uh, soft tackle hare's ear. Uh, but it's tied with Australian possum and uh, it has the distinct... Uh, honor, I guess it is, of being the first beadhead version of this, uh, or of this kind of thing anyway. So um, we're going to start with a TMCO 5262, and I've got a, uh, oh, I think it's a 1 8 inch bead. Yep, 1 8 inch gold bead. Um, I'm going to use tungsten. Um, when uh, beadheads first came out, there were they were only brass, and uh, just sort of a, as a matter of history, um, I remember when bead heads first came out, the first beads that were marketed by Theo um, is they, uh, the beads were not counter drilled. Um, so you actually had to bend the gap of the hook open a little bit to get them to, to go up around the bend. So made some strides since then, but uh, um, these days we've, we've got uh, counter drilled beads, beads that make the job a little bit easier. And uh, I'm going to start with a 1 8 inch gold on this. This is a size 12 hook. Uh, I'm going to take some 15 thousandths lead wire and I'm going to make quite a few wraps, probably 18 wraps. Um, I've already lost count, so I'm just going to wrap darn near all the way up to that bead. And then I'll break those ends off. And toss those. And then I'm going to push that lead up into the back of the bead. And you can see with that counter drill, um, that helps to center that bead. And then I'm just going to come in with some 8 dot black Vivas. And I'll just start this behind the, behind the lead there. And I'm just going to Wrap forward over the lead, just anchoring that in place. Not really, not really trying to cover it, just anchoring it in place. So the tail on the fly, most of this fly is made of Australian possum. Um, and Australian possum is, is uh, somewhat hard to find these days. Brent at uh, Umpqua um, found me maybe the, the last existing hide of uh, Australian possum laying around. I think I, I, I'm sure I have one at home. And mine, this one is sort of a gray color. Um, the one I had was, was a little bit more tan, um, so I think there were maybe two color phases of this critter, but uh, uh, apparently they're, they're exceedingly vicious and uh, will uh, tear your arm off or something like that, because there's not very many of them, uh, or very, very many hides left in the world. I don't think it's an endangered critter by any stretch, but uh, uh, it is hard to come by. Uh, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to take, I'm kind of up toward the, the face of the critter. There's some little bit shorter hair up in here. And I'm going to cut a little tuft of this out, and we're going to make this into the tail. I'll hold this up. You can see I've cut far more than I really need for the tail of this fly. But I'm going to just take a little bunch of that fur, and I'll set the rest aside for the next one. And just bundle that into a, a nice little tuft, like so. And I'm going to tie this in for the tail back here at the bend and I want a little a little shorter than the hook shank would be I'll just wrap forward over those butt ends and then as a topping for the tail I'm going to take just a strand of crystal or I'm sorry a strand of pearl flashaboo and I'll tie that in and catch it and then I'll fold that front end back so I'm doubling it and I'll wrap back over that so that flash is on top of the tail and then I'll cut that just a little short of the tips. And I'm going to save that strand here because now I'm going to tie it in for my rib. So I'm going to take that same pearl flashaboo and tie that in for my rib right down to the bend of the hook. So now I'm going to take some of the longer fur. And this piece I've cut more out of the, the center of the hide. Um, and I'm going to take a, a bit of this. And you could you know, certainly mix this up in your... Uh, in your dubbing blender or with a can of air uh, to mix it up into a little bit coarser dubbing or you know, a little bit more mixed dubbing um, or you could just mix it in your hands. Um, I'm going to try a little bit of this shorter stuff in there too. And you'll see, you know, hair's ear would make a, uh, a really nice substitute for this Australian possum. It's a very similar hair. This is very soft stuff. Um, it's like a long rabbit. Um, I'm going to have to kind of dig in to see how available this stuff is these days because I can actually think of a few things I could use this for. But I'm going to take this, this possum dubbing now and I'm going to start to dub it down on the thread. And I want to build 
a fairly fat noodle on my thread here. And hopefully I got enough off that hide to do that. Um, if not, Lord knows, I've got the whole hide. Um, but I'm going to start this dubbing at the bend. And I'm going to work forward. And you can see that lead kind of helps you build your taper. It's a fairly uh, robust taper as we come forward here. And I'm going to come pretty close to the bead up here. I'm not going to leave myself a whole lot of room. Um, you can see with that neck of the bead in there behind there, um, uh, it looks like I'm right up to it. I do have a little bit of room in there, but not much. So now I'm going to wrap my rib and I'm going to wrap this pearl flashaboo just evenly spaced up that body and then I'll tie it off up behind the bead as well and trim that out of there. Now I like to sort of brush this out a bit. I'm just going to use a little wire dubbing brush here. Kind of make that a little shaggier. You know, when those, those bead heads first came out, um, you know, they were pretty off the wall. They were, uh, you know, very different from, from everything we had been using. And they, uh, uh, yeah, we weren't sure that they were going to go over. Um, you know, I was a, a young man back in those days, but uh, uh, there were plenty of uh, old guys that are like, I'll never fish with anything like that. And um, I still know a lot of those old guys. They're still around, and, and yeah, they fish with bead heads now, just like everybody else. But... Um, this is this is a, a pretty cool historical uh, value fly. Um, the collar on this originally is uh, bronze mallard. Um, bronze mallard is these days, just right now, currently COVID days, um, sort of hard to find. Um, you know, it's not that it's unavailable. If you're a duck hunter, you could certainly find some, but uh, um, you know, getting it commercially has been been pretty tough. So what I'm going to use instead is a partridge feather, just a Hungarian partridge feather, um, and that's what he started life looking like. And I'm just going to create a separation point here at the tip and stroke those fibers back like that. And I'm going to tie this feather in by its tip end, just up here behind the bead. I want to anchor that in place, and you can see the tip here sticking out. I'll usually fold that back and catch that with a couple of turns as well. That just anchors that in place and keeps it from pulling out quite so easily. And then I'll trim that tip off. Now I'm going to grab this partridge feather in my hackle flyers, and I'll fold, fold these fibers back. I like to wet my fingers a bit to start to fold these fibers. And it's only going to take about a turn. You're not going to get much more than a turn, to be perfectly honest with you. About a turn or two of, of partridge there, just kind of a big soft tackle collar. And then I'll tie off on that bare stem just behind that bead. And come in and trim that stem out. Just to anchor that last little bit of stem down there. And then the, uh, the collar... Uh, I'm just going to use some black rabbit for um, Theo's original recipe um, called for uh, Australian possum from the back, um, and this hide just is not very variegated. It's uh, it's fairly kind of gray, mottled gray color all the way through. So um, the fly had a pretty dark collar. So I'm just going to use some black rabbit here, and I'm going to dub this on up here behind the bead. And I don't want to push that collar back too much. I'm just going to dub a dub a little head there. And then I'll whip finish just up here behind the bead. And I kind of let the whip finish turn slide off the back of the bead there. And I'll come in and nick my thread out. And then I'm going to take that dubbing brush again, and I'm going to start to pick that dubbing out. Um, you can see I kind of overdubbed that a bit, and I did that on purpose because I was going to pick it out. Um, if you put on exactly the right amount and then pick it out, you've got not enough. Uh, so you want to overdub a little bit with that black dubbing and then pick that out and kind of let it bleed into the collar. And, and there's our posse bugger. Um, kind of a cool little fly, Nondescript, nondescript you know. Um, you know, certainly you could take this fly out today and catch fish on it. This is a, this is a buggy little critter, but uh, um, that was one of the very first, uh, first beadhead flies to ever exist uh, that any of us knew about. So um, there's Theo's posse bugger. Uh, change the world right there, so don't think you can't do it too. Uh, thanks for watching. I'm Charlie Craven. Boy, excuse me, boy, I uh.
what I was thinking about too is I'm really glad I didn't have to tie a bunch of those when I was tying in the commercial tying business. That that would have definitely slowed my time down. But those are that's a great job, Charlie. He's a, he's a fantastic fly tire. Really as good as anybody in the in the whole fly tying world right now. So we appreciate Charlie doing those two flies. We're gonna wrap things up now and there's just a ton of talk about right at the end here is uh, how much I personally appreciate young Umqua. Umqua has been one of the big leaders and drivers in the fly fishing industry and they've they've meant a lot to me as a fly tire. Uh, I've been loyal to Umqua since the very first time that I tied the first contract flies. And also being a fly shop uh, owner and manager, I look back on what Umqua has meant for all of us in the in the industry. And, and I just think it's really commendable and I appreciate Umqua going to the effort to put these these uh, things together, these fly time programs, and and they, you, there's going to be one of those these things every week on on Thursdays on YouTube. And you, if you haven't subscribed to the Umqua channel, then you need to do that because uh, you know you you'll get. I mean, looking at all the social media, Facebook. Uh, Instagram, all this stuff, you want to be signed up with Umqua. I think it's really important. Uh, we want to thank Trout Unlimited for their support of this. I've been a life member of Trout Unlimited for, I don't know how long, a long time. And they, when I look at what they've accomplished for us, for all of us, uh, we really appreciate their support. Uh, I mentioned Gary LaFontaine talked me into writing a book and I'll show you this book. This is the one that I wrote, the Spring Creek book. And uh, I'm having trouble getting it to line up on my camera. But anyway, this uh, you can get this on Amazon. You can uh, you can get it from our shop. That was a hardcover. They also have it out in a in a paperback, which cuts the price down quite a bit. And then another book. This has actually been my top selling book. And th this is uh, how do I get that on there? There we go. It's called Fly Fishing Guide to the Henry's Fork. And Gary LaFontaine had a hand in this book as well. Uh, Gary and I combined, we co-authored a little book uh, but with the same title, but it went out of print. And I couldn't, I tried and tried to figure out how we could get it back in print and it just wasn't gonna work. So I finally decided to start from scratch and and write that book. And it, it's really been a great book to, if anybody's planning to come up and fish the Henry's Fork, the hardest part for me writing that book were, were the maps, because I, I didn't know how to make maps. I'm not a real computer whiz, but I had to take the Google Maps and then do some serious work to get the maps to come out but they're very accurate maps, they're to scale. And so that can be helpful. And if you're coming up to fish the Henry Sport, I, and you never have before, especially the book, this book can really help you. Uh, you know, I've been in the fly fishing business now for 50 years. Uh, started out as a fly tire and did a little bit of guiding uh, out of Jim for Jim Danskin in West Yellowstone, Montana, 
I did that in 74 and 75. And then we uh, decided to open a fly fishing shop in Island Park up there near the Harriman Park. Back then we called it the Railroad Ranch. And our shop is called Henry's Fork Anglers. Uh, we've got some of the most experienced guides. Uh, I, I, one of the things I'm most proud of in all the years we've been in business, which is Henry's Fork Anglers was uh, first incorporated in 1976. And Bob Lamb started working for us as a fishing guide in 1978. And I've got some other guides who came on board right after Bob did. And they're still guiding for us. We've that, and it's been great having these mentors who've been guiding for about 40 years or more. They've just been mentors for the younger guides. And I, I just appreciate them and the work they've done to make us successful. Uh, I don't spend the time up there. I used to, when we went along for a number of years, Cheryl and I, my wife, we were looking at usually 12 hour days and we were open seven days a week, seven till seven. Uh, we over time have been able to get more better employees so we didn't have to work so long. Uh, one, well, I, I probably better not get in and name them all, but they, they really, been some great young men that have worked for us and young women. And uh, we appreciate that. Uh, I still like to go to the shop and I'm usually up there oh three or four mornings a week. That, our shop's about 35 miles from where I live. I enjoy the drive up there. I go up early in the morning before the traffic gets going. And well, I like to spend the mornings in the shop because we have a lot of customers that I've known for many years. And also, as I mentioned, we've been working together with some of our employees for so long that we've become best friends. And I'm hoping that I can keep going up there uh, for a lot of years to come. But the shops is now managed by my youngest son, Chris, and then we also have another manager named Todd Lanning. He's Todd's a he's a terrific fly tire. In fact, he's been working so hard on these no hackles and he's got them down. He's doing a pretty good job. So I appreciate being uh, asked to be a part of this. I feel honored. Uh, I feel honored to be a part of the fly tying legacy with Umqua and to share that with some uh, other great tires that have all come on board with the contract tire program. So I hope you'll remember that next week there'll be another one of these programs Thursday night. So hope you can tune in then. Thanks.